Welcome to Polaris Live. This is Server Kashmiri welcoming our viewers from around the world to this series of programs on the United States and China in the world. This program is brought to you live in conjunction with the Foreign Policy Association of New York. I'd like to remind our viewers that you can ask questions throughout this program using the comment button on the right-hand side of the screen. Time permitting, we will get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. My guest host today is Professor Arthur Krober. He is co-founder and research director of the China-focused service Dragonomics Gavikal in Beijing. He is an adjunct professor of economics at the New York University Stern School of Business, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, a senior non-resident fellow of the Brookings Tsinghua Center in Beijing. His book, China's Economy, What Everyone Needs to Know, what is published by Oxford University Press and widely used as a textbook. Please welcome Professor Arthur Krober. Well, Hello thank there. you very much. Thank you very much, Sarwar. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to see you again. And listen, you have a lot of ground to cover. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the show over to you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity uh, to host uh, our guest, Susan Thornton, uh, who is a very distinguished uh, retired diplomat uh, who spent 30 years in the State Department. Um, her final position there was acting assistant secretary um, for East Asian affairs, East Asian and Pacific affairs. <clears throat> uh, she was deeply involved in diplomacy with China, other Asian countries, um, both in East Asia and Central Asia over many years, uh, and was deeply involved in many of the critical uh, uh, parts of the relationship between the U.S. and China. And um, she's now a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai Center of Yale Law School and continues to be very active in dialogues between uh, the U.S. and China. So I'm very happy to welcome Susan here to discuss the U.S.-China relationship and where it might go at this rather difficult and complicated time in international relations. So Susan, welcome. Hi, Arthur. Thanks. Great to be with you. Okay. So uh, as Sarwar mentioned, we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's dive right into it. Um, and uh, hopefully Susan will come back. She seems to. Yes. Okay. There you are. Um, so I guess the first question is just how would you characterize the overall state of the U.S.-China relationship now? And how do you think that it's changed in the first year or so of the Biden administration? Uh, yeah, big question. Um, basically, U.S.-China relations have changed dramatically now over the last few years. Um, we took a sharp turn in 2018 uh, in, with the issuance of the Trump administration's national security strategy calling China the ma U.S.'s major security challenge and uh, trending toward adversary. It was the fastest 180 degree change in a major U.S. foreign policy consensus in recent history. Um, I think things went definitely south from there. We started with the trade war in spring of 2018. And then by the end of the Trump administration, after the COVID outbreak, we had senior administration officials calling effectively for regime change in China. Uh, Biden administration came in in 2021 and basically kept Trump's policy toward China. But in addition to what had gone before, um, <clears throat> made some slight adjustments. But the biggest adjustment was to gather U.S. <clears throat> allies and partners um, to join the U.S. in this uh, kind of anti-China approach. Um, and China, of course, has uh, felt threatened by this, unsurprisingly, and has responded in kind, I would say. Um, and that's all not even touching on the current global situation we have, which is, I think, about to turn the U.S.-China relationship in, uh, again, in a sharply negative direction, um, if, if it wasn't already going there to begin with. I think we'll, we'll get back to the 
complication that has been introduced by the Russian in, uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine a little bit later. But before we get to that, I'd like to probe on a little bit more on, on how we got to where we are now. And I guess one question is how much of the change in uh, US-China relations is driven by top-down decisions of the leadership in both countries? And how much has public opinion in the um, in both countries played a role, either in terms of setting the agenda or uh, crystallizing it? Well, my view is that this is driven from the top in both countries by uh, political leaders uh, and leadership decisions. Um, you know, people basically subscribe to major media narratives in both countries on the issue of U.S.-China relations in general. Um, you know, and in both countries, I think the governments are driving the narrative. Um, so maybe, you know, I think Americans generally don't pay a lot of attention to foreign policy and they get most of their thinking about what's going on out there in the world from what they, you know, sort of see political leaders saying and what they see major media outlets covering. Um, and I think the same is certainly true in, in China. The average person in China doesn't um, you know, have uh, spend a lot of time in their day deeply analyzing U.S.-China relations. They take what they get from the media, and certainly in China, that's driven by government merit narratives. But it's in the U.S., it, it is as well. I mean, maybe the implication of this is something that's somewhat hopeful in that you know, if the governments themselves saw fit to change the narrative on U.S.-China relations, it's, it probably wouldn't be that. Uh, that difficult, or at least it wouldn't be impossible to do so. Um, the swings in public opinion on U.S.-China relations in both the U.S. and China follow very tightly these changes in leadership policies from the top. So um, I guess that means potentially we could see a change back if, if there was uh, some impetus on the part of either government to do so, which we don't have at the moment. A, a quick uh, follow-up on that. I mean, how much do you think um, additional strain is put on the relationship by the fact that that basically no one has been able to travel to China for the last two years, and so whatever types of people to people to contact there may have been, either at the government level or in many non-governmental spheres, has the reduction in that people to people contact contributed significantly to the deterioration in relations? I mean, certainly it hasn't helped, right? The fact that we cannot have in-person conversations, um, you know, on any issues, never mind sensitive issues, directly with Chinese counterparts contributes to what is already in U.S.-China relations, a, a sort of huge gulf of misunderstanding and day-to-day -day interactions, I think. Um, I think that the misperception in U.S.-China relations is probably greater than misperceptions that I've seen otherwise in my career, um, you know, between the U.S. government and other governments out there in the world. It's not just language. It's uh, there are a lot of sort of procedural process, institutional and cultural differences. And there are a lot of, um, you know, just misunderstandings that don't get clarified if you're not, you know, talking all the time to counterparts and exploring some of these things. So I think, you know, the COVID-19 thing has been terrible. Um, for for that, it's also uh, set up this this kind of blockages uh, to people to people ties, which are partly because of COVID and partly because of other new restrictions that have been introduced in this period of the last four years, where the relationship has deteriorated. Uh, but I do think that uh, to some extent, the you know people to people ties are not going to overcome this very negative uh, dynamic that comes from the governments uh, and is a top-down narrative. Um, it, it certainly it can help to sort of expose and flesh out what the differences are, but really uh, to get an improvement in relations, I don't think just having more people-to-people -people exchanges is gonna be enough. Now, so let me take this one step farther. So you've clearly laid out that there's been a major change in the relationship and it's much worse. And I guess the question is, why should we care about this and, this, and is this a bad thing? Because uh, there's certainly a lot of people in what you might call the China Hawk uh, camp in the United States who would say, look, our previous constructive relationship with China created a lot of bad consequences for the U.S. And maybe it's in the U.S. interest to have a more uh, 
confrontational relationship with a, a China that is um, uh, adversarial uh, and that has interests that don't necessarily coincide with our interests. So what would your response be to that position? Yeah, I'm not really sure that I've ever heard a convincing case for why constructive relations with China would be bad for U.S. interests. Um, you know, I just I just don't agree, frankly, with that assessment. And actually, I haven't really heard a good, clear assessment of the racking and stacking of how that would be true. Um, you know, bringing China into the global economy, which I mean, to to remind ourselves, it wasn't just the U.S. doing that. Um, you know, but it did allow China to get rich. And some people have, I guess, misgivings about that. I personally don't. I think it's it's great for, um, you know, one and a half billion Chinese people to to be better off than they were previously. But it also allowed everyone else in the world to become better off, you know, especially countries in Asia. But certainly the U.S. is, is not exempted from that. And the focus on development in China for the last 40 years has not just fostered growth. It's also, um, I mean, we should be reminded now, especially that we haven't fought any major wars um, over the time that basically China has been uh, joining the international community and pursuing its own development. So um, now we're seeing there are major power wars, and I think we are on the brink of something you know, quite different. But to look back on the last, you know, 30, 40 years, I think um, in the future, we will look back on these 30, 40 years that China was joining the global community and think, yeah, that was a pretty good time for U.S. interests. And I think we're going to miss it, frankly. Yeah, well, I guess the argument uh, would be that, number one, you had this uh, massive relocation of manufacturing capacity from the US and other Western countries to China that built up China's um, industrial and, and technological capacities and left the US, first of all, with a lot less employment in that sector, which has been a huge uh, dislocation uh, for our society and with just a lot less uh, basic uh, industrial capacity. And so there was a weakening of the US. That would be one argument. And then I think the second argument is that because of its increased technological capacity, China is a much more significant military uh, competitor to the United States. And it may have interests in, in East Asia, particularly that directly conflict with ours. So building up a rival power uh, through this kind of economic cooperation is viewed as a mistake. Um, so what would be your response to that? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, on the first issue, the China shock has been written about, and I think there are numbers attached to that about how many million jobs uh, moved from U.S. manufacturing directly to offshoring of manufacturing to China. But I mean, let's remember, this is a process that started a long time ago, I mean, remember in the 70s and 80s, how worried we were about the same phenomenon happening with Japan um, and the rest of the East Asian tigers then in the 90s. And so the China uh, shock comes from sort of economies of scale in China and its manufacturing juggernaut. So it's sort of the final step in this, but certainly didn't uh, only, you can't only lay that at the feet of, of China coming into the global economy because there were a lot of other players coming in as well and coming um, and, and rising up. And, you know, we have India coming in next, presumably, which will continue this kind of trend. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, the issue of sort of China's technological prowess and how much it helps it to have a sort of militarily aggressive policy in East Asia um, is something that people raise and China's military buildup, of course, is concerning. But I mean, to me, that argues for an even more uh, obvious need to try to manage the security architecture and the relationship with China in a way that doesn't lead to security ruptures in Asia, which, which will be even more devastating or um, you know, potentially devastating than security ruptures in Europe that we're seeing now. Yeah. So that brings me exactly to the next thing I wanted to raise with you, which is if we look at the Biden administration policy towards China, as you know, they've essentially accepted the basic framing that was left over from Trump, that this is now a strategically competitive relationship. And they've left a lot of the specific things in place in terms of tariffs and uh, export controls and so forth. And it seems broadly to me that the Biden administration has looked at the 
relationship with China almost exclusively through a security lens. And we've seen some enhancements to the US security architecture in Asia uh, through the Quad with Australia, Japan, and India, through the AUKUS alliance with uh, the UK and Australia, et cetera. And very little attention paid to the economic dimension of not just the bilateral relationship with China, but the overall uh, Asian situation. So would you agree with that? And how do you think that the balance between security and economic interests and policies should be struck? And, and is the Biden administration doing a good job of that? Well, I mean, this is an area that I have a lot of concern about. I mean, what I see is that China is focused on the economic playing field in the Asia Pacific, which is the field of primary importance and concern to other governments in the Asia Pacific and Indo-Pacific region. Um, and, you know, security is important, but a lot of what we see being done in the name of security is, I think, uh, uh, basically an overreaction um, that comes from this kind of unsustainable zero risk tolerance attitude that that um, the U.S. has adopted that I think not many other governments, frankly, in the region have adopted. Um, and I, I think, you know, we can't only go to the Indo-Pacific region and talk about security because that is not uh, really where governments in that region uh, place most of their effort and priority. I don't think, um, you know, threat perceptions are not equal throughout the Asia Pacific region and where they really see um, you know, the most actual threats to people's livelihoods is coming from not just economic issues, but transnational security issues. And we saw this recently with Secretary Tony Blinken's visit to some of the Pacific islands where most of what the leaders there talked about was their security concerns emanating from environmental factors and economic factors. Um, which, you know, tends to put us in a kind of an uh, uh, unbalanced uh, kind of discussion with these partners. And I think the Chinese focus on the economic playing field in the Asia Pacific gives them a comparative advantage in this region that we need to really pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other way that Biden has framed his foreign policy generally uh, is the competition between democracies and autocracies. And we've had his summit of uh, democracies. Uh, and then, and clearly, you know, one of the targets of this is China, which is not by any stretch of the imagination, a democratic state. Um, why do you think that the administration has chosen to set things up this way? And what are the pros and cons of building a foreign policy around this binary division between democratic and autocratic states? Um, it's a very good question. Why has the administration decided to set it up this way? Um, you know, I wonder a lot about that. I certainly can't really endorse this binary approach to international relations. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that I've served in my State Department career in a lot of places that could not be called democracies, um, but nevertheless worked while I was in those countries to try to manage and improve relations between the United States and those countries. So I guess why do we set it up this way has a lot maybe to do with our own domestic uh, situation. I, I looking at sort of Biden's President Biden's trajectory on this, you can sort of see when he talks about the issue of democracies versus autocracies, he talks a lot about proving that democracies can deliver. And I take that as a direct reference to our own domestic situation and the need for reforms and improvements in the way our own domestic governance operates. But, you know, is it a useful framing for international relations? I personally don't think so at all. Um, you know, why are we shrinking the pool of helpers? You know, Singapore wasn't invited to the summit of democracies and apparently is not considered a democracy. So it won't be included in the group of useful states that we would call on to pursue international relations. I think that's not only preposterous, but it's also very corrosive to U.S. soft power around the world. 
And how do you think this framing of democracies versus autocracies is seen in China? Well, I think the Chinese have a very clear view that the U.S. is trying, again, to set up this kind of Cold War block-on-block -block competition and using democracies versus autocracies as a way to bring other countries on board for its uh, policy to sort of undermine China's uh, growth, development, and influence in the world. Yeah, okay. So that brings us, I think, right up to present events. So when we talk about creation of blocks and sort of the division of the world on somewhat Cold War-esque uh, lines, we had on February 4th, uh, Vladimir Putin visited Beijing for the opening of the Winter Olympics, uh, spent a lot of time with Xi Jinping, and they issued a joint statement uh, which said that the China-Russia relationship has no limits and no forbidden zones. Um, and I think a lot of the analysts who have looked at this have seen this as the culmination of a fairly long period of much closer relationships between um, uh, China and, and, the, and Russia, which have, and that closening has, has accelerated, I think, a lot since uh, Xi Jinping took power in China. Um, and then, of course, almost immediately after this document of uh, friendship and support was signed, uh, Putin decided to invade Ukraine, and China has been a notable outlier in its unwillingness even to characterize what's going on as an invasion or to um, join in international condemnation or um, uh, be sort of a constructive force in trying to bring the two sides to some kind of a ceasefire or peaceful uh, resolution. So there is a view that, you know, it's not just the United States that is setting up a sort of a block on block competition that China has thrown in its chips with Russia uh, to create a block of two authoritarian states whose mission is to alter the international order in a way that's much more favorable to them. Um, what would be your interpretation of the uh, Russia-China relationship? First of all, just on its own terms, and then we'll get into the implications of the Ukraine invasion a little bit later. Yeah, um, you know, Russia and China have a very obviously long history. They have a 4,000 kilometer long border that they share. Uh, and they have a very up and down kind of relationship over the past, you know, a couple of centuries. Um, and, you know, this is a relationship that has certainly been fraught. And it was that fraught relationship that was exploited by the visit of Richard Nixon 50 years ago to China to pursue the opening of China, um, very much in the minds of, of President Nixon and Henry Kissinger at the time about how this strategic relationship between China and Russia would, um, you know, play in U.S. foreign policy and in its uh, efforts to sort of construct this new international order that was uh, coming off the heels of the of the Second World War and then the post-war uh, period. Um, you know, the Chinese will tell you that China-Russia relations at the moment are the best that they've been in at least a century, um, and that this is a very important partnership for them because mostly because of what's happened with US-China relations. And I think we have to think about the China-Russia relationship and the level that it has gotten to in the context of the last five years of deterioration in US-China relations, because I think it's directly related. Um, you know, that said, uh, the Chinese will tell you that this is not an alliance. There is not a military uh, support part of the sort of unlimited cooperation between Russia and China. It's a partnership. It's an important partnership for China. Um, and it's even more important now in the in the context and seeing sort of the threats that come from the United States. Um. Yeah, I guess the question is, yeah, it is a very important partnership that then uh, 
um, though not an alliance, which then was immediately followed by a um, you know Russian invasion of Ukraine, where China has taken a very uh, careful uh, approach to its comments about that. And this has led to a lot of speculation that either China knew ahead of time what Putin's plans were for Ukraine or had a pretty good sense uh, and was willing to to tolerate it. Uh, and this seems peculiar in a number of ways, one of which is, of course, China has long had a pretty strong principle of respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, which Russia has completely violated by its invasion of Ukraine. And China has not sort of come out and stood by its former principle. Instead, it's taken this very equivocal approach. Um, so what do you think is what do you think is going on there? Is, uh, are they have they basically abandoned their principles uh, in favor of this this new strategic alliance with with Russia? And if so, what what does that tell us about Chinese actions in the future? Uh, well, I think um, a couple of things. Uh, people are talking, and you mentioned too, this February 4th joint statement about the sort of no forbidden zones in this partnership. But, um, and in fact, you know, I've been talking to a lot of Chinese counterparts recently about all of this and asking a lot of pointed questions. And what they would say is that the February 4th, you know, joint statement came in the unique context of, um, you know, President Putin agreeing to personally appear at the Beijing Winter Olympics opening ceremony um, in the context of a Western diplomatic boycott, so no one else would come. And also, um, uh, in spite of the fact that the Russian Olympic team was under sanctions, and so uh, Putin uh, going to the opening ceremony wouldn't be able to sort of interact in an official way or salute the Russian Olympic team. Um, and so this was a huge, you know, favor really to uh, the Chinese side uh, on the occasion of something that was a very important ceremonial event to them and one during which they were basically shunned by all Western governments. So they have said that um, in that context, uh, the sort of document that was prepared, um, you know, reflected this kind of uh, very, it was a nod to sort of Putin's doing, doing this appearance. And they've also said that the Chinese were frankly um, surprised by what happened on February 24th, the invasion of Ukraine, in spite of the fact that, of course, um, <clears throat> Chinese government had been warned by the United States uh, about right. what Putin's plans were. Uh, they obviously didn't uh, believe the U.S. They chose to believe Putin and they were, um, you know, not correct in that assessment. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question now is what what explains their subsequent rea reaction? And I think you're right. The issue of principle on ter territorial integrity and sovereignty is in sharp conflict with their desire not to um, completely upend this relationship with Russia that they've worked to. Uh, you know, kind of shore up on, in the recent period, uh, in spite of the fact that I think they were badly misled, probably, and manipulated by Putin um, into, you know, this position that now is kind of making their international reputation be sullied for sure. But what are they doing in terms of what their position is? I mean, number one, you know, the Chinese certainly view this conflict as a conflict really between Russia and NATO or Russia and the U.S., um, and so they see it as kind of far from their own, um, you know, sort of regional interests. Number one, they don't think it can be solved without, um, you know, the U.S. NATO side and the Russian side actually engaging and 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 talking. Um, but number two, they're also trying to sort of preserve diplomatic space, I think, for themselves. I think Chinese are perfectly clear that it's an invasion. But to say that publicly would narrow space for, um, you know, diplomatic engagement. And so they're very careful about their public statements and what they call it. They would never do, for example, what the U.S. has done, which is already declare that Putin is a war criminal and that Russia has committed war crimes because they would right. see that as narrowing diplomatic space for a solution. 
Um, and they've been very clear that they want to see a negotiated settlement um, and that they might do something to, to mm -hmm. push that along. But I think they don't really know what to do and they don't expect that they alone can have um, enough influence to stop the war. Yeah. OK, so that brings us to the final question, which is that the response of the United States and its allies uh, to this invasion has been this really unprecedented campaign of economic sanctions. Um, and uh, so I think there are two questions as relate to China. One is to what degree they haven't supported the sanctions, but so far it seems like they're going to comply with them and not not violate the sanctions. And so would you expect that to continue? Are the Chinese basically going to play ball with the sanctions even if they don't like them? And then second of all, what's the risk that um, uh, the U.S. decides that China is doing too much to aid and abet uh, what Russia is up to and uh, therefore deploy secondary sanctions against China? So I think on this that the uh, Chinese, of course, have said very clearly that they don't agree with the sanctions and they regard any sanctions that don't go through the UN Security Council as being illegal. They're very worried about what they see as the advent of sort of economic warfare on a, on a weapons of mass destruction, as they say, scale. And they don't know where this is all going. And they're very worried that it is going to basically upend the entire global order and badly affect everyone. But I think for the moment they have, um, you know, seen that they will comply with the sanctions in terms of not, um, you know, doing dollar transactions, not exporting uh, items that are prohibited by the sanctions, et cetera. Uh, but they've said they're going to maintain normal trade relations with Russia, i.e. all of the things that um, are not captured by the sanctions. I think that they would uh, continue to try to, um, you know, trade with Russia, et cetera. They've said pretty clearly that they are not sending military aid to Russia and that they would not do so and that that's misinformation. Um, but I think that we will see continued trading between uh, Russia and China. They've taken wheat shipments from Russia. There are a lot of Russian reserves held in China that they can uh, draw down in, in trade. Um, and I think that this normal, so-called normal trading relationship between Russia and China, if the war drags on, will come into the sights of uh, the United States and its allies and partners. And uh, China will risk being sanctioned even for what they call normal trading relations. So, yes, I do think the risk of uh, sanctions on China coming from this war in Russia are, are quite high. And just to, to wrap up on this, I mean, do you think it would be appropriate for the U.S. to um, move to secondary sanctions um, on China in the way that you have described? Or is that, would that be overreach? Well, I have <laughs> uh, very strong views on the U.S.'s uh, abandonment of diplomacy and overuse of sanctions and military tools. So in general, um, I think our efforts to apply sanctions in uh, sort of every case of every transgression that we perceive around the world is really um, a long-term disaster for uh, the international economy and the United States. Um, if we move to secondary sanctions on China for normal trade with Russia, um, are we going to move to secondary sanctions on other countries like India for normal trade with Russia and other countries that have said that they're going to continue trading with Russia, um, or will we just sanction China? Um, you know, what will that do to the credibility of the entire kind of sanctions regime? Um, and then the question of how fast can Russia, China, and lots of other countries in the world who don't like the sort of cascading U.S. sanctions regimes um, move away from dollar transactions into something else? So I think these are all, you know, questions that while it feels good maybe in the moment to levy sanctions, um, is this really a good long-term strategy for, for us and for our own interests? And I, I have a lot of questions about that. Right. Well, more questions than answers, I guess, at this point. But we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Susan, for being with us and sharing your expertise and insights on a very, very intricate uh, relationship that's growing more intricate by the day.
So Good to be with thank you, you very Thanks. much. And Sarwara, I guess it's back to you. Well, this is this has just been such an engaging dialogue. You you folks covered everything that's in the uh, uh, headline. So I thank you very much, uh, uh, Susan Thornton and Arthur Krober. And let me just tell our viewers uh, that uh, you've been watching a continuing series of discussions on the U.S. and China and the world uh, on Polaris Live. I hope you will be able to join us for the next episode. Uh, and until then, goodbye.